So welcome to Lives in the, Lives in the Game, 24-7 Football. Uh, today, of course, George is not presenting. Uh, I'm here to speak to my father, who is here alongside me. Not a footballing uh, icon, but a rugby league icon who began his life in football. There's a weird connection there, you'll understand later on uh, how it works. But of course, today, yes, the father and son duo are here alongside <laughs> each other. It's kind of weird, this, uh, speaking to my father about things that he always does himself normally. Um, so, big year for you, Dad. You obviously took your final presentation at the Good Friday derby. Mm -hmm. um, amazing time, though, almost 40 years in rugby league. Mm. Um, but obviously your life in football was before that. How did that begin for you? Well, um, I mean, I was a football fan, a sports fan, uh, probably from the moment I was first born. I didn't realise it until I was about seven or eight. And in 1958, the Munich air crash happened in the February, and I was eight years old then. Uh, I know it's very difficult to understand. That means I'm 70 in 2020, <laughs> but there you go. Uh, so I was an eight-year-old in 1958. Um, <clears throat> and I think every uh, football fan, every sports fan, every youngster certainly was absolutely gripped by this tragedy, what happened, what unfolded in Munich that day. And I became, overnight, a Manchester United supporter. And I wrote to the club and I wrote to Bobby Charlton's mother, actually, uh, and she responded back to me um, and I got a signed photo of Bobby in black and white. I've got it somewhere up in the loft. Um, and from that moment on, I was a Man United fan. I'd never been to Old Trafford. All I knew was that Bobby Charlton played for them. But, you know, and I saw him on the television in the old black and white days playing for England and playing in the FA Cup final. That's all you ever saw on television way back then. Um, and so the affinity with United grew for a couple of years. Um, my dad and I used to go, because Liverpool then were in the second division, we used to go and we used to stand outside the Bullens Road end at Everton, Goodison Park, and we used to queue up and pay at the turnstiles to go and sit in the stand above the goal. And every time that Manchester United played Everton at Goodison for a couple of years, I was there. And in those days, Everton flogged them. I remember sitting through a 5-0 defeat one day at Goodison. Everton were a really, really good side. But I remember there was players like um, Ernie Taylor. I mean, I'm going back years now. Young, young people who watch this will, will not know what on earth I'm talking about. But it was, it was great days. Uh, and I fell out with all the family. My granddad, my dad's dad, was a Liverpool fan. And he couldn't understand why I was a Manchester United fan. But, of course, it all traced back to the Munich air crash. And then in 1962, I saw the light. I was taken to Anfield. Some would say you didn't, but you... <laughs> oh, I saw the light. I was taken to Anfield, um, and I actually watched them get up. Uh, it was 61. I actually watched them get up out of the old second division into the old first division and gain promotion against Southampton at Anfield uh, with my dad. And I was completely and utterly hooked then on the Liverpool experience. And the Kemlin Road stand was built... We applied for season tickets for the three of us, my mum, my dad and me. And we luckily got three season tickets in the brand new cantilever stand that was then built for the start of life in the first division. Uh, and there were nine pounds a season in those days. So 27 quid for three seats. And we had a family meeting in the summer when we got the offer of these seats. Now look, we can either go on holiday <laughs> or we can have the three seats at Anfield for £27 and we'll have a day out every other, every other week at the match and we'll even maybe once or twice go to away games. So we had a vote and we won 3-0 on the vote and we got the season tickets and we didn't we for, for, we went to holiday that year and we had season tickets at Anfield. And from that moment on, I was a Liverpool nut, absolute Liverpool nut. That's incredible. I didn't know all that because we spoke. <laughs> no, we spoke about Grandad in the past, and yeah. uh, I know he was. He, he himself was a, a excellent footballer. He was an accomplished well. footballer. He was. He was a centre forward for Egworth People's Hall, which played in the Ising Gary League. I don't even. They, they used to be certainly in existence when I was at Radio Merseyside. The Ising Gary League, but he played in the Ising Gary League, and he actually scored one year sixty six goals as a centre forward at that level. Now it wasn't professional football, obviously. Uh, he had a trial with Kidderminster Harriers. But for the intervention of the war, I think he could have actually been a professional footballer himself because he, he, he had a trial. He played for Kidderminster Harriers and he had a trial for Wolves 
Uh, but then the war came along, bang, six years of his life had gone, so he never, he never actually progressed to be a professional footballer. But 66 goals in a season is remarkable because not even Dixie Dean... This is what I know, I remember now. Not yeah, even Dixie, Dixie Dean, Dean scored 60, 66 goals in a season. So he was a good player. He was, he was a good player. Uh, somewhere, again, in the loft, I've got pictures of him. Do you think he would have maybe gone down the journalistic route of writing or, yeah. or more just for uh, the he, player? Uh, he, more he, he probably would have liked to. Um, I think, as I say, but for the intervention of the Second World War, I think he might have actually been a professional footballer on £5 a week or whatever it was then because there was no, no proper money in football in the 30s and the 40s. Um, but uh, I'm not sure. I mean, he, he could play. I, I, I could play a bit. I could play very, very, very low amateur level. Right. And I've always said, yes, you love your sport. You love any sport, football, cricket, rugby, golf, whatever. If you can't play, the best thing to do is to write or talk about it. And that's what I decided to do when I left school. I was going to be an accountant, actually. I was being pushed towards being an accountant. Can you believe well, that? Well, it would have been a steady job. A steady job, nine nothing, to five. Exactly. Edward, they used to say at school, Edward, you don't want to work weekends. You don't want to work anything other than nine to five. You don't want to know not where you're going from one minute to the next. You want a nine to five job. Go into accountancy. So I thought, OK, I'll go into accountancy. I didn't get maths. <laughs> That's an old level. So there was a major problem, but I was I actually recruited to go to a, a, a college in Kirby, Kirby Tech, as it was then, uh, to, to study a business course um, and become an accountant. Where that came from, I'll never know. I met a, a pal of my dad's who was an accountant, and oh, he was driving a lovely car, and he you know, it looked pretty, pretty good. I thought, this is okay. I'll have a bash at this. But I, really, I didn't really want to do that. I really didn't want to do that. So what was the what was the way you then got from doing the accountancy route to then trying your hand at doing what you ended up doing? Well, I never did the accountancy route. I never went to Kirby never College. Went that far. No. Funny enough, I would have met your mother maybe. <laughs> because she went to Kirby Tech. Oh, she did? She went to Kirby Technical College around about the same time as me. So we never actually met until much much later in our lives. So rather than being Lover Radio Mezzyside, it would have been Lover yes. Kirby Tech. Yeah, Lover Kirby Tech. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. That'd be a bit different, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would have been. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So I never, I never actually got there. I saw um, an advert in the Liverpool Echo one night for junior required to train as journalist with the Northwest News and Sports Agency, Eight Duncan Street, Birkenhead. So my dad typewritten, type wrote my application, and we sent it off. And I signed it at the bottom. We sent it off. I got an interview, and in those days, you know. You virtually walk through the door. If your shoes were polished, you got the interview. You got the job. So I walked through the door, had the interview, got the job. And my first role at Northwest News and Sport in Birkenhead was to reply to the forty others who had applied for the same job, all of whom had handwritten their applications. Mine was typewritten. Very nice. So I obviously like a typewriter, folks. and a typewriter, not a, not a computer, because they weren't invented then. Uh, not a word processor. I'm a typewriter with carbon paper. <laughs> uh, and I think because I sent a typewritten application in, that was a big tick in the box. They thought, oh, this fellow can type. Of course, they gave me these 45 things to reply to. I'm like, uh, <laughs> in front of the typewriter. <laughs> Oh, Hitting it with one God. finger, but we got through so, that. So obviously, you'd not been the one that. That's no, no, my dad, out, my, dad, so no my dad had done the, had done the, written the, the application found, for yeah. me. So, so I lasted there eight months, and basically, a junior required to train as journalist was, as the two, there was Andrew Stratton, and uh, Jim Beacall. Jim Beacall was the proprietor, and they were the two main reporters. They went out on the stories. They went to the courts, and I, then, when they typed out their reports. In those days, you didn't just send it by email. You had to actually physically ring up and phone it to copy. The copy department was a, a, a bank of typers, typists who typed out the reports. Which would then go to print. Which then went onto a big steel thing that went, put -choo, put -choo, and out came, the, out came the paper at the end of the day. So it went, I was doing that and making coffee, making tea, going for the errands and running the errands for about eight months. Now, it's not what an apprenticeship really should look like, but it did give you an insight into how to write a story, what elements you needed in the story and how to do it. So I did that for eight months, and then I applied to the Warrington Guardian. So were you not doing sport at all? No. At that well, I did. I actually went. And this, this used to kill me because it was Saturday afternoons. 
Now they told you about working weekends. Yes. Well, he, but the, but the, the, <laughs> I didn't mind working the weekends, but the, the, the bit that killed me was, on the Saturday, we got in the car and my dad drove me into Liverpool to James Street Station as they were off to Anfield oh. to watch the match. And I went on the train, through the tunnel, on a bus to Caldy to report for 30 words at half-time for the football pink, the Echo, on the old Caldeans Rugby Union Club. Now, I'd never seen a rugby <laughs> ball in my life. So what I used to, 30 words, you know, it was a huge, a huge assignment, 30 words. And then full-time score on the whistle and 100 words on the Sunday for inclusion in the Daily Post. And how old have you been then? The I was then uh, 16, 17. God. So what I used to do, I used to get me a little book and I used to walk <laughs> around the back of the crowd and I used to hear, oh, it's a great pass from Jimmy Scroggins or whatever his name was. Oh, great pass from Jimmy Scroggins. And I went further around, oh, what a great tackle by Phil Jones. Great tackle by Phil Jones. And marked down 30 minutes to write 30 minutes. And that formed the basis of, <laughs> of my 30 words. And I, I think I got the score right. I probably didn't get the interpretation of the game right. I thought, I can't, I can't cope with this. So I, I wrote a letter to the Liverpool Weekly News. And I got a job working in sport on the Liverpool Weekly News. Ken Rogers, who, is, who was the, uh, still is, I think, at the Liverpool Echo, he was the Everton reporter, and I got the dream job. I was the Liverpool reporter. So I was then at Anfield every other week, or every week, writing a column uh, with Ron Yeats, the captain. Ron so Yeats did a column for the Liverpool Weekly News. Do you think you would have maybe been looked at for that if they hadn't seen you'd done the sports editor role at Ashford? Mm, probably not. I, I'll never forget when I... I'm was surprised when you walk in the door, I think... You were a sports editor. You're only 18 <laughs> know, years old. Yeah. That's good. That's now, yeah. nowadays. Uh, well, you, no chance. Chance. you wouldn't have no. a, a chance no. of that. Well, you wouldn't have a chance of getting the job because you wouldn't have a piece of paper in your hand that says you've got a diploma in Whatever. broadcast or written yeah. journalism from a, a college or a university. Uh, so I'll, I'll never forget the editor's words when he brought his number two in and he said, uh, Right, he said, We're taking a chance on this fella. We're putting him. In. And you know, I think I went, because I was on £18 a week, which was. Uh, I think I went in on about fifteen pound a week. She could have took a pay cut. So I took a pay cut. All the way. I wouldn't have been that. <laughs> I took a pay cut, but I wasn't paying out bus fare all the way and train fare that's all the way true. down. That's true. I wasn't paying Clear rent. So and I was living at home. Happy days. Happy days. And that was really where the beginning of the my love affair with sports journalism began. But as I say, it was nothing to do with sitting there and doing years and years of training and writing dissertations and going for diplomas. So how, just, did, how did you get to know about that job at I have no the idea. News? I have no idea. I, I think I just wrote. And just back. So this is what you've always said to me, and this has always been a, a trademark of, of your working life, is that it's just happened for you at the right time. Been in the right place at the right lucky. time. I've been, I, Mark, lucky, I've been blessed. Absolutely blessed from start to finish. Start to finish. I can't, I can't tell you. I cannot tell you. It's incredible I, that, though. It was. Because you've not, you know, there's been no sort of time when you had to kind of you know worry about it and wonder and you know you've just done something and which has led on to something else well I started work at the Northwestern News at 16 when I left school uh, 1966 I finished work in the at World Sky Man City. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you're a Man City fan <laughs> it really it, George, it, it really it niggles is. it really niggles me that you're a Man City fan <laughs> um, George cheers behind the camera you can't see that but he just did so 1966, started work at uh, Northwest News in Birkenhead. 2019, finished work at Sky at Wigan St. Helens. And this is where I've been blessed. Never been out of work in my life. Never missed a day's, missed a few days' work for various reasons. Mm -hmm. But was always, always employed throughout the course of my working life, which is, which is incredible. And I know that, and I know how lucky I've been. Well, it's also testament for that. to the fact that you're obviously bloody good at what you do. Well, I mean that's that good, you, if good you're no or good, bad. You, you, we got rid of you. you. Well, yeah, but there's an opinion on the other side, isn't it? But uh, but I, I woke up on I mean, the twentieth. I am obviously biased. <laughs> course, you know that. But, you know. I woke up on the twentieth of April this year, and I said to to your mum, I said to Carol, do you know this is the first time in my life I've been unemployed because I'd retired. Yeah, yeah. That must be quite a. Well, it, it's amazing, as you say, to have had that longevity in it, but that's... Unbelievable. And I, I've been so lucky. I have. I mean, uh, yeah, OK, you know, you can, do, you can do the job, I suppose. But luck comes into it so much. It really does. Being in the right place 
at the right time. And there again, that's how I got into broadcasting, because after a while at the Liverpool Weekly News, advert appears for um, uh, another freelance news agency, this time in Southport. We're living in Magull. Southport's as close easy, easy done, yeah. as Liverpool is. Uh, Northwest News and Sports Agency, Roger Blythe, the late great Roger Blythe, yeah, yeah, was on yeah, Granada yeah, television yeah, yeah. years ago. Wonderful voice, fantastic writer, great journalist. And um, I got that job. And by the back door, Roger was working, doing shifts at Radio Merseyside. We were supplying taped interviews, because in those days it was all on the little quarter-inch brown tape mm -hmm. on Ewer, U H. ER tape recorders, and we used to go out, me and the other guy who worked there, Malcolm Allsop. The splicer and the, the splice, kind of cutting it, yeah. And we used to go out and record the interviews of a particular local story, and we sent them off. And I think if the agency got the tape used, it was like tenner or fifteen pound as a fee, and we got a little bonus. So, needless to say, we almost ditched the <laughs> we almost ditched the written word if we could, and we went out and we did interviews. Okay. I'd gone to do the lunchtime programme from Rome the day before and the day of right. the European Cup final, Liverpool's first ever European Cup final uh, in Rome. And uh, we'd done all sorts of bits and pieces, been all around Rome for a couple of days, uh, finished, watched the match, da da da. And the following season, um, I ended up taking over as the sports editor of Radio Merseyside. And that's where, that's where the connection with Liverpool really began for me. Because well, sports editor, so you're the main well, cheese, that big cheese, aren't you? I suppose we, Liverpool were in Europe. Liverpool were winning everything at the time. You know, they were the the best side by a country mile in the country. There is no question about that. They won more than they lost, mm. um, and all the way through. You know, you were we were with them on the plane. You were with them on the coach. You went to the away matches with them. All the home numbers in your diary? I've got all the, I had all the players. I and Bob Paisley's number, I had that in my diary. And every day I used to ring up Bob because we had a sports bulletin at 3.30, 4.30, 5.30 and in the main news programme at, at 6 o'clock. And I used to ring him up. Anything I'm doing, Bill? And Gordon Lee. You know, and Billy Bingham at Everton. And Johnny King at Tranmere. And I try desperately to think of the Chester. Anyway, and Southport because there was... There was five teams in the league in those days on Merseyside. And we used to ring them up every day, which is something I think that journalists these days don't do enough of. They don't ring up clubs and say, anything going on? What's happening? We, when we were at Northwest News, that was drummed into us. You made calls to the police, the fire, the ambulance, to find out anything happening, anything happening. So as if there was a you know, major incident, you were on top of it within 60 minutes of it, of it happening. Uh, we used to ring, I used to ring him up and say, anything going on today, Bob? Oh, yeah, and he used to give us, you know, well, we're looking at this, we're doing that, and so-and-so's injured, and so-and-so. It was so open in those days, so open. They were such great people. And Bob Paisley was, uh, was just fantastic with me, as were all the players. In, today, you've got to make an appointment to have an appointment to see a player on appointment. I used to turn up at Anfield, walk through the main entrance, and stand outside the dressing room. And as the lads came out, Emlyn, will you do us a... Yeah, yeah, mate, yeah, yeah. yeah. You do us a quick two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. None of this, can I have A, B and C, and the club come back and say, you can have B, you can't have C, and you might get A, but you, and then you sit around for two and a half hours waiting for them. I used to just stand outside the dressing room door. All right, Em, can we just do a quick piece? Yeah, mate, yeah, yeah. Off we went and did a piece. Jimmy Case, But that's Graham because Sooner. you obviously, over time, you've... No, that's the way it was. With them, yeah, well, we get, well, you gain a relationship and you gain a bit of trust with them, but that's the way it was. That's the. It was an open door in those days, and I know the industry has changed its, it, it, itself, and the industry has sent news reporters to find out the the muck and the dirt on the players, and you know he's in a casino, he's out drinking, he's doing something else. But that wasn't your. That was not. Our, that was football. nothing to do with. We were we were just doing the football. But, and it wasn't on in those days. So we had this rapport with the players and with the coaches, with the managers. We, they used to come in and do phone-ins. Gordon Lee came in and did a phone-in on a Saturday night after a match one day at Goodison. Um, that, that's like... That, I, don't remember, I remember... No, it's, well, you've got... No, you've got... You know, and the, there was no corridor and um, advertising hoardings behind them, all different for each broadcaster and each... each and there was no foreign... For, there was no foreign interest whatsoever, and 
I just literally we just stand in the corridor and the players came out both sides yeah. home and away the players came out and we just asked could I do a quick two minutes with you lads any chance you know and more often than not they did I'll come down the players lounge we went down the players lounge we did it outside the players lounge while they were going in to see their wives and families it was so different than it is now because I know how regimented it is and I know how it has to be regimented I get that I understand that because there's so many different outlets these days everybody wants a piece of the action but also but you were you were the the, the local BBC station oh the local yeah. bread and butter of people listening to it to find out about their beloved teams on a local level yeah that's you know? true so you had, true. you had I suppose in a way you had more um, weight to what you do because they knew you were of, of the people locally. well we were we were you know? we were local radio you yeah know? and uh, and the echo Liverpool Echo Daily Post. They had Michael Charters, who was the um, Liverpool correspondent in the end, and they had Leslie Edwards, years and years ago, who was the Everton correspondent. They had one, one for Liverpool, one for Everton. And um, you know th that that is the way it used to work. And would you all sort of help each other out, or was there still a bit of a snobbery with? Oh no, there was the Merseyside Mafia. The National Press was known as the Merseyside Mafia, um, and they they all got together, and they did their press conference. Mm -hmm. Uh, and once they'd done their press conference, we were either allowed in or we did our press conference before the match or after the match. Mm -hmm. And we were asked to leave and then they did theirs. Because obviously they needed something new for the Monday morning mm -hmm. than, or the Sunday morning than, than we were getting immediately. So we left and, the, and they, used to, they used to share their quotes around and all that business. Now this would be perhaps would be a time when obviously Martin Tyler was at City, Radio City, and you were at Radio Merseyside. No, Martin, Martin Tyler um, was never at, at Radio City. It was Clive Tilsley who was at Radio City. Richard Keyes who was at Radio City. Cl Martin was, um, oh, Martin was, was, was ITV. That's where I first came Wasn't in. that where you played the football? Yeah, we played the football against the commentators 11. That's when I thought it was City yeah. and you were Merseyside. Yeah, yeah. That's when you had that. Uh, yeah, well, we had the Radio Merseyside team, cele celebrity team, and we used to go off and we used to raise money for local charities. And Martin was the uh, centre forward for the commentators team. Martin was a good footballer in his day. Um, and I was the centre half. Now he praised you and said you were a good footballer yeah, well, as well. Yeah, I used to you kick know. him. I used to kick him <laughs> and kill him down there. Um, he did actually on that, on that documentary. But, but, but that's where I came. Alan Parry was the link. Alan Parry was at Radio Merseyside. Alan Parry went to Radio 2, stayed in London and ended up on Match of the Day, ITV Athletics, <laughs> and eventually on Sky. Right, right. AP... Our best man at our wedding all those years ago is the link between the football commentators 11 in London yes. and us. And we used to get on the bus at Merseyside, a coach, and we used to go there. This was our big trip of the year. Down we went to, normally to Wickham or somewhere like that. And we played, or um, the, BBC had a, the BBC had a sports ground um, out in the sticks and we used to play there. I can't remember the name, but I should do something. Part Anyway. And we used to go down on the bus. It was our big, big weekend out, our big day out on a Sunday. Down we went to play them. And that's where I first really came into contact with Martin Tyler. And he's about six foot six and he's all elbows and knees and that. And I'm about six foot two. So I used to really get underneath him. And I, mean, I wasn't anything like as good as he was. But if he had the ball, I went for him. <laughs> and knocked him about a bit. And that's, that's uh, you know, he used to knock me about more than I used to knock him about, by the way. But he, he has put this legend out that I was the, the dirtiest player he ever played against. He used to kick him up Hill and down Dale, which I tried to, but I never really got close to him enough to do it. Maybe once or twice. But that's where the, the friendship with him right. arrived. And of course, the next thing is Martin is at Sky and I'm at Sky. And, and so the, the friendship continued on. So there was no, there was no um, Mossy wasn't in that. I, John Motson played. John yeah, Motson played in the I commentators' eleven. Yeah, wow. Motty played. Alan Parry played. Jim Rosenthal played. Um, and they used to have a few ringers as well. You know, from from man, so did we. We used to, we had Ian St John. Did you? Ian St John played for us. The same. He said to me once, Ian St John, he said, Eddie, give me the ball, you bloody dope. <laughs> Uh, he's a great guy, in St. John. He's, and the, that was from the, the the early days, and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ian St. John. I'm thinking about uh, Dave Hickson played for us. The great Dave Hickson played for us. They all came along and played. I mean, could you imagine? Uh, Sergio Aguero. Well, can you imagine? I was going to say Aguero or Mane or Mohamed Salah in years to come playing for the Radio Merseyside Commentators Eleven. 
But that, but that's not incredible though that that was a. But that, that was, was the way it was of a, of a time. Wasn't that was it? the way it was. We used to rub shoulders with these guys. You know, it was fantastic. Which I suppose is why they were more willing and easy to talk to you about because they felt they were you were friends really. Well, we were. You know? We were. And as I say, we used to travel everywhere with them. When they went to Europe, we were on the plane with them, sitting next to them. It wasn't like players and manager at the front, media at the back. It, we were. I sat next to Jimmy Case, coming back from Germany. Tommy Smith. You know, we used to have a, and, and it was in and out in the day. Mm. Or in a, you had to be there 24 hours before. So Tuesday night we flew. Or Tuesday we flew in. Wednesday night we flew out. Mm. Um, and coming back. You know, we used to share stories of the games, and that's where a lot of the stuff used, people used to get it. And I used to do interviews on the plane with them for the bulletin the following morning. There's a picture of you also driving a bus with the. There's a picture of you sat down the <laughs> wheel of the bus with yeah. them. Is that? That was a, that was a, the, that was something that probably the BBC would have a heart attack if they knew what was going on. It was a listeners' trip out to Blackpool. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was a team bus. No, no, I'd like to bus. think it was. No, no, no. We took some listeners to Blackpool or onto the Royal Irishman and we, oh, right, okay. we took them off in a coach. <laughs> you shouldn't have mentioned that. You get some on the sack at the BBC. <laughs> no, we'll cut that. Sure, we'll cut that. We'll cut that. Um, but, and also, but I guess for, for you at that point then, with your dad also being now as wildly passionate about the Reds as you were, having a son who was with all these people and doing what you were doing it must have been incredible for him as well like well and your mum as well i mean your mum i know well I mean, yeah, was, yeah my mum, you know, yeah so yeah. proud of that all that i stuff. think i think my mum was more proud than my dad <laughs> um yeah he didn't he didn't say much to be fair but uh, you know he, latterly he probably didn't know what i did you know because yeah. that's that's the way he ended up but um yeah we, you know i used to share a few stories with him because that's but that, that that is incredible you know like I can imagine me coming home to you and saying, well, I'm working now, say, doing the tours at Anfield. Yeah, oh, yeah. You'd be, oh, God. You know. I'd be there every day, I'd be with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but obviously, it, it, it's amazing, though, that for you... Well, that, do you know, was, we had a... We, that the, the, that's, uh, you talk about the... And they do, they do tours at Anfield, as you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but before they did tours at Anfield, we had a, we've got a Spanish uh, family who were very close to, courtesy of, of your mum, and um, their son came over here to stay with us Andreo. here and Andreo came over to stay for a, a week or so and we took him to Man City wasn't on then by the way Mark. No, there was no, 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 no Man City no, Ma no Man City tours then we, went, we took him to Manchester United and Brian Hall who sadly has since died Bamba little Bamba Brian Hall number eight for Liverpool uh, he took us around Anfield as a favour and this is this is years after I'd finished. Mm -hmm. But Brian Hall took us around Anfield, took us into their museum, showed him the cop, and we actually he actually got to meet That's right, uh, he did. the players it was, it was and the manager. Yeah, we went to a training training. session at Melwood, yeah. 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 So that, it, the, the the relationship goes went back years. I wouldn't know anybody there now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because I've not been doing football for forty no, years. No, no. But in those days, that's the sort of relationships you develop, the sort of camaraderie, the friendships that you, you, you develop with these people. And we used, we've been, been back once or twice, courtesy of Carlsberg, who were the sponsors of Liverpool yeah. once upon a time. And we went to a couple of games on the back of, uh, of Carlsberg because Tetley, Carlsberg Tetley was sponsoring the Super League at the time, mm. got an invitation to go to Anfield to a couple of games. And as we walked through the door, there was Ronnie Moran, Big Yeatsy, Alan Kennedy... Uh, all the, the, the uh, uh, Joe, was Joe there? Joe Fagan? I think he was. Kenny, Kenny Dalgleish. Mm. And they treated you, treated us like Old friends. friends. Yeah, which of course you are. Yeah, I, I played golf this year at H uh, Hillside, uh, courtesy of Bet Fred in the um, British Masters, the Tommy Fleetwood event, the British Masters. At, at, celebrity uh, Pro-Am, wasn't it? The celebrity, well, it was a Pro-Am. Uh, and Bet Fred put a few teams in. And uh, I met Kenny. There and he came over, you know, just like, you know, he saw. I've got, I've got a, a jersey with Warrington Golf Club captain, 2019, 2019 yeah. and he said, "Ah, oh, Captain Pugwash." <laughs> <laughs> no, he said. So we just chatted away, so you know, how are you doing? And, you know. and because of that, in 1985, a couple of weeks later, as a fan, as a fan, nothing else, as a fan, off we went uh, with Alan Parry and a couple of pals to the Heysel Stadium. And we all know what happened at the Heysel Stadium. And I fell out of love a bit with football from that moment. So what happened next? Well, we got, we got to uh, 
to the stadium. We had a fantastic day. We had lunch in the sunshine. It was a lovely spring day all the way down. And we got into our seats and we watched the game. And we knew there was something going on because I said, shouldn't this game have kicked off? It's about eight o'clock, shouldn't this game? Yeah, yeah. And then Phil Neal came out and there was helicopters floating about and there was obviously something going on on the terraces. We had no idea. No idea whatsoever what was going on within the ground. Joe Fagan came out, I remember, and tried appealing, calm, for calm, keep calm, you know, please, you know. And all of a sudden then, I mean, it wouldn't happen now, with people dying, the game kicked off. Oh, obviously, it's just been a bit of a punch-up, you know, nothing. So we ranted and raved about whether the penalty was a penalty, whether it should have been allowed or not allowed. And we watched the game, beaten 1-0, lost in the European Cup final, disappointed, oh, out we go. Right, you know. And as we went out, there were armoured cars almost in the streets coming down. We thought, what's all this about? Bars were shut. Hotels were shut. We couldn't, we couldn't get a, a room anywhere. There was no chance. It was just like lockdown. lockdown. Some major's gone on here, we had no idea, we didn't really know what was going on. We heard later on, obviously, on the radio as we were our way back. We just got back in the car and we drove back to Cali through the night. We got the first ferry home. And then I got the I picked up my car at Alan Parry's house and, and I got home. And of course the 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 story unfolded about about what had happened and I thought oh, I don't I fell out of love with this a bit here. Because it was such a, you know, could have been such a great day, and it, and it wasn't. Uh, and from that moment on, really, that was when you were starting to dip your toes into the rugby dip, league. Starting to do the rugby league more and more and more. Um, then we had the horrors of Hillsborough, which was even worse. Did you ever, at any point in that time, I'm probably, probably going to say no, you didn't, because you had such a wonderful time. But when you were doing stuff in rugby league, did you ever sort of? look at what other people you knew at the time doing stuff, the Martin Tylers, the Alan Parrys, and think, well, we should maybe stay in football. No. Never? No, never. Yes, it's a bigger audience. Yes, it's a bigger profile, a higher profile. I understand that. But no, never. Never. No. No, never. It was, uh, we were... You're happy, we happy were, with your lot, I suppose. Absolutely. You, we were happy with your lot, but also we were pioneers. We... Rugby league had never been given the profile that Sky Sky gave it mm -hmm. from from minute one. We did we were doing live matches. We were doing you know Sunday nights at six fifteen originally. Then it went to Friday nights, um, and it was it was treated as we wanted it to be treated. Listen, it was never an equal of football. No 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 sport on television is an equal of football unless you are absolutely one hundred percent died in the wool in that sport like cricket and golf and horse racing and boxing and tennis and whatever. football is king football leads the way i thought in 1992 when sky got the premier league deal wow this is the start of something because the premier league would take the company through and we would all come in on the backwash behind it and that's exactly how it happened and we were resourced we were allowed to do things we did overseas tours, we went been to Australia five, six times. We did a grand final in Australia live in 1991. I was over for that for, uh, for two weeks. It was just fantastic. So you were obviously at the best of both worlds. You were lucky in the time you were in football yep. for that fantastic time yep. that Liverpool were enjoying. Yep. With them all the way. And then you went over to rugby league and had a great time with that. So Absolutely. You, you, it really... It, <laughs> You can't say better than that, can Not you? Not at know all. What I mean, I mean well, you know, how does it happen? No, it's how, happened. How, for you, it's been how has it happened from a, a, a little lad from the Egg old row in Egbeth, yeah. began in Egbeth, you know, never went to university, never went to a technical college, went to a secondary modern school in Mughal, didn't come out with much. I probably got an A-level in, I was going to say ball, <laughs> but I, I, maybe I shouldn't, but yeah, an A-level in ball and... Here we are, here we are, blessed, as I say, blessed. So if you think about sort of a time that stick out in your mind then, um, 
we've been asked a load of times about you know classic mo- times in rugby league that you've no- enjoyed and you've watched for your time with an iconic moments that you've seen your beloved Reds. Oh, and you've things that really still to this day the Rome moments, the Rome European the, the Rome European Cup final, um, the time that Liverpool played and beat Celtic in the European Cup tie at Anfield in front of a packed house. And you've been there in different as a punter, but also punter, as a, as yeah, a punter, and, yeah, as yeah, well. yeah, 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 yeah. Kenny, Kenny Dalglish scoring at Wembley to win the European Cup for the, the second time. Going to going to Nottingham Forest the following year and being knocked out of the European Cup, and that was another moment. I mean, the, 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 this is another moment really that sums up the way it was for me in those days. Again, outside the dressing room, Liverpool have lost two 0 Gary Bertels and scored two goals against Liverpool for Nottingham Forest, who were the champions then under Brian Clough. And we're up against it now. You know, They were probably going to get knocked out in the defence of the trophy. Nobody. None of the players. You do us two minutes. Mm. Do us t- no, not, no, not this week. No, not tonight. I'm thinking, jeez, I've got a... I've got a I've got a bulletin. I've got, I've got, I've got a bulletin to yeah. fill tomorrow. I've got. To, I've got to have something to, to to take home with me. I've got to. What am I going to do here? What am I going to? The last man out with his gabardine mac over his arm was Bob Paisley. God. And I said, Bob, I know you don't want to do this, and I know it's an imposition for me to ask you, but I'm begging you. I, I need something for the morning. Would you just give me a quick two minutes? And I could see he was absolutely crestfallen that they lost. And he go, yeah, I go on then. And he sat, he stood there with me, and he did me two minutes on the match and what was what what it meant and how it was going to be unfold in the second leg in a fortnight's time. And he did it. He did it. Very hard for him that to do. Oh, for you. it's been dreadful because he knew you exactly. Suppose, that dreadful. friendship. And when I was at the BBC, moving on, um, we actually did a program on Bob. Tony Adamson and I, uh, Tony was the cricket, co- uh, the tennis correspondent, but he also did a lot for Sport on 2 presenting. He and I did a, a, a documentary on Bob Paisley. And we went to Bob's house in West Derby. And there was a piano, an organ, in, in, in the middle of the, the lounge. And I said, do you play, do you play the, the organ? Ah, yeah, I have, a, I have a tinkle and that. I said, would you play us something? <laughs> And he really well sat down and he played, he played Amazing Grace or something. He re- honestly. And that was, the pa- pa- and that was part and parcel the of, of the programme for the BBC. He, he, wow. It was a bit like, I'm playing all the notes, correct notes, not necessarily <laughs> in the right <laughs> order, but he played for us. Wow. And I thought, wow. That's wow. incredible. And Manu, wow. you obviously had been a, watched as a fan yeah. and obviously got to know as yeah. a friend. Was in, well, you know, we had a great, a great relationship, if I say so myself. He was a, he was a, fan, yeah. a fantastic bloke. I can't yeah. believe that he never became a knight. I've said that on the telly when we have a bit of a chat on the telly during you know, down times in the, in the rugby league yeah. and we're talking about Liverpool playing Man United and Man City on Sky. The full, you know, I remember the day when Bob Paisley was the manager. I can't believe he never got a knighthood. He should have had a knighthood. The stuff he won... And a man who didn't want the job. He always used to say, I don't... You know, when Bill Shankly resigned in such dramatic circumstances, I think, that, hadn't they just won at Wembley against Newcastle, 1974? And he shocked the world by announcing he'd retired the following... And Bob didn't want the job. He always said that. I never asked for this. And it was a little bit like... David Moyes, if you think about it, following Alex Ferguson into Old Trafford. How do you follow a legend and make it work? Now, nobody has at Old Trafford. Moyes, Mourinho, uh, that, um, Gunnar Solskjaer. There's no, Gunnar Solskjaer now, and Van Gaal, wasn't it? How do you follow? They've all failed and are failing because of the legacy and the man that they're following. Bob moved in, and the success continued. Incredible. Well, his name's now embroidered in the, this, oh. season, this season's uh, ho- um, home shirt. In the label inside it, 
above it it says Bob Paisley does inside it inside the Liverpool shirt does it does well how this, nice this season it should be on the it should be across the middle oh, is it on the back is it on the back bit I know well, it's either on the inside or on the back of the collar it should be written in letters this big because he is Shanks began it all no question Bill Shankly began it all they came from Glenbuck cherry pickers via Huddersfield came to Anfield took us up in 62 you know did everything. Won the cup for the first time in '65. I was there that day that was when the that saint day. nodded the ball. Well, it was great, but my mum couldn't come. You know, we only got two of the three tickets came out of the draw. We all went down. We thought we'd get a ticket on the Saturday morning for my mum. She couldn't come, so we went. And lo and behold, where me and my dad were sat, there was an empty seat all the way through the game. Oh, Phew. So there was a tinge of sadness that yeah. she never saw them win the Wembley. Of course, it was on the telly, so she stayed with the people we were staying with and watched it on the telly. Yeah. Uh, but I was 15. You know didn't mean anything I didn't go out celebrating but it was just the elation of winning the cup for the first time they always said when they take the liver birds down off the liver building Liverpool will win the FA Cup and the liver birds never came down apparently they were being down in 1950 when they got there against Arsenal the liver birds were taken down and were being cleaned oh. and they got all the way to Wembley and just before Wembley, the bloody birds were put back up on the live of buildings and they lost to <laughs> Arsenal 2 0. So they said they'll never win the cup while the live of birds are still on top of the live of building. They were on the top of the live of building that day. Saint nodded one in, 2 1 against Leeds. And, uh, and that was it. But, uh, so Shanks, Shanks laid the foundations. The stories about Bill Shankly are legion. You know, the better people qualified than me to tell stories about. I didn't know Bill that well. Bob Paisley, yeah. he picked up the gauntlet. He not only ran with it, he achieved everything that he did with it. Yeah. And he, he was, to me, the, the greatest manager. And I'm not a Man United fan anymore, but I know what Alex Ferguson's done. Bob was the greatest manager, to me, of all time. Now, we obviously also have the same intrepidation with Mr Guardiola being well, in charge exactly, of the city. You know? exactly, exactly. So you kind of hope that it's, um, you know, not this will carry on and when whoever well, replaces him well he in many ways is the Bill Shankly of Manchester City now he's started everything I mean they've got a few Bob by the way there's a few Bob behind them mm. you know the Sheik has done a fantastic job the stadium is a fantastic stadium the tour is a fantastic tour the legacy is being built i got to say that the legacy is being <laughs> built uh, you know for the future and they are still the team that everyone's got to beat I hope that this is the year that Liverpool well, this do is a it. Good question to ask you. At I this hope. Point, no, at this point, so you obviously, I think the country fancies, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> city fans. Uh, they fancy. They ch- so obviously, you but this year think this. Do you think this could be the? Well, I thought that last year, and they were ten points clear at Christmas, and they blew it. You know, and I was there, courtesy of your good self, for the Liverpool game just after Christmas, mm. and so we, you and I, saw the only defeat of the season <laughs> and it was the crucial defeat that cost them the title in the end to lose it the way they did last year was it 98 points last year 98 points nine times out of ten wins it by a country mile man city are a fantastic team man city are a great club they've got a great manager they've got some fantastic wonderful players liverpool are going to have a dig this year i really think they'll have a dig i think the champions league victory last year has helped um, I think if any Liverpool fan was asked what would you swap you would swap the Champions League now for a Premier League title at the end of this season mm-hmm. but they've got to keep it going they need a few injuries if they get a couple of injuries up front they lose Mane they lose Salah mm-hmm. where do they go then they might have the problem up front that Man City currently have got at the back because they're a bit shaky at the back the minute I'm doing a Gary Neville now he said they won't be they won't be right until the new year until they get their players back Gary Neville and all the Man City fans of the golf club hate Gary Neville with a passion <laughs> so I'm, do, I'm doing a Gary but, but they are a bit weaker at the back than they have been but anyone that can beat another Premier League team 8 nil, you've got to be wary of them well it's been great to learn about it all from me I mean I've heard a lot of stories <laughs> before but it's just so nice to hear you talk about it and well, it's a been a pleasure a different uh, format Thank you, old man. No, no problem. I'm sure they will have enjoyed it. I hope so. I hope so. And if Man City and United fans are watching, you know, be like a rugby league fan. (laughs) Hate me. (laughs) (laughs) 
Wonderful. Thanks, Dad. Great. Okay. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Eddie, Dad, old man, for doing the, the job today for us. Uh, obviously, like the video on the Facebook page, 24-7 Football, and subscribe to the channel. And George will be back next time, not me, this next time, but George, in Lives in the Game with uh, the next instalment.